thank you, everyone, and thanks um, to the Alps, uh, Federico, Polina, and all the people who are volunteering here. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time as well. I know I'm on the third hour now, so hopefully you still have the energy to listen to me. I've only got 60 slides, so don't worry. Uh, not much. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm working at the University of Exeter. We've got, a lot, we've got some um, classes on psychedelics and philosophy. We've got a colloquium, um, Breaking Convention, the largest European psychedelic conference will be at Exeter University in April. So we've got a lot of things going on. Um, I work with, in the philosophy department, but also um, with the uh, psychology department. I teach philosophy of mind in psychology, which is very unusual. I work with Celia Morgan in the psychology department, who's a ketamine expert. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about, um, I'm just gonna, it's going to be more theoretical, um, it's going to be a conjectural. I'm going to speak about the need for metaphysics and psychedelic research. So this is the plan. Um, I've got a primary point. I'll, I'll go through the PEM, try extinction. Um, what is metaphysics? What does it mean? Psychedelic-induced metaphysical experience, uh, why we cannot avoid metaphysics because of the mind-matter problem. And then I'm going to um, finish with a, with a conjecture about um, psychedelic integration with metaphysics. So the primary point is this. Psychedelic-induced metaphysical experiences will be more adequately comprehended and integrated with recourse to metaphysics. It's almost true by definition, almost a tautology, yet it doesn't really, really happen yet. Um, now, before I go into it, I just want to make this distinction, or tristinction. Um, tristinction is not really an English word, but it should be. Um, so I want to, dis to tr distinguish or differentiate psychedelic experience from metaphysics, from mysticism. So one can have psychedelic experiences which are not metaphysical, not mystical, for example, laughing, or um, locating lost objects, or becoming a better hunter, a better fighter, for example. There's a great book from a, um, a shaman in the um, Brazilian basin called uh, The Falling Sky by uh, Davy Kopenauer, who talks about these uses in the, in, in the uh, Americas in French and English. Anyway, so one has psychedelic experience. Uh, some of it can be, uh, sometimes, it can be mystical, and we'll go through a definition of mysticism later. Um, and some of it can be metaphysical, and they can all intersect. Um, I generally say that um, mysticism is sort of more religious, broadly speaking, metaphysical, more logical. But they do interact, as we sh shall see. Um, and I, I make this, I think it's quite an important distinction, because often metaphysics and, and mysticism are... Um, are um, thought to be the same thing, but conflated is the word I'm looking for, but uh, they're not really. So what is metaphysics then? Well, the word comes from Aristotle's book of the same name. Um, it's really a collection of, of, of smaller texts that were put together by an editor after his death. And uh, the book was, the collection was put after Aristotle's book, The Physics. So it literally means after physics, like on the bookshelf, you know, that's where the word actually comes from. Um, but in that book, you've got the general framework of what metaphysics is today. Um, I won't go through all of this, but very quickly, um, the main question really is ontology, the study of being. So what is, what is the world made of ultimately, you know, so very basically speaking. So is it physical, um, from which we get physicalism? This was big in ancient Greece, not with Aristotle, but with Democritus, Lucifer, and so on. It's, physicalism is generally the working framework of science today, I should say, in the West. Is it mental? Is that, and matter sort of comes from the, from the mind or the mental, that's idealism. Um, big in Germany, um, is making a comeback now to some extent. Is it both physical and mental? Um, which is the sort of general Christian or Abrahamic um, view today that uh, soul and body are distinct substances. A substance is something that can exist by itself. Is it, and this wasn't in Aristotle really, is it, imminently neutral. So in other words, is, is the fundamental reality neither mind nor matter, but something which gives rise to both, or something that can be seen through both? I'll go through that. That's Spinozism, very basically. I'll talk about him later. Um, or is, is there a transcendent dimension to reality? This was uh, Aristotle's teacher Plato, who believed that there existed a, a, a realm of forms outside space and time, like forms of justice, beauty, mathematical truths, and so on. So that's the, that's the broad kind of basis of metaphysics today, but also other questions come in. I mean, I teach, I've taught metaphysics at Exeter, and it's, it can get very dry and, and, and uh, 
logical. So we talk about, you know, what is causation, you know, mechanical causation, mental emergence, teleology, form, universal, space, time, the eternal, qualities such as properties and relations, um, modalities like what is possibility, what is actuality, what is necessity, and so on and so forth. So all of those are interwoven and non-exhaustive, but that's a general overview of what metaphysics means from a philosophical point of view, in other words, from the original point of view. Sometimes metaphysics can mean all kinds of things today, but this is what it means in academia. Um, in Exeter, we've put together this metaphysics matrix. Oh, there, I use matrix again. <laughs> um, so this is, not, this is an inexhaustive draft. It's not finished. Um, but it's a way of um, sort of um, presenting options. And I think this is important because often when, when you speak to people who haven't really thought about this, they think, well, either, either the options are either physicalism or materialism or dualism, and that's it. But there are very many other options which map onto, as I shall try to show you later, um, psychedelic experiences. So from this matrix, we've created, me and this uh, postdoc at Exeter, um, a questionnaire. It's quite difficult sort of to put these um, different uh, views into, uh, into questions that everyone can understand, but I think we're getting there. And at the moment, we're actually running a trial with this. Um, but let me just put it more simply um, in, as a presentation. So we've got two concepts, two ideas, mind and matter. Um, how do they relate? Well, uh, Leibniz uh, thought they uh, didn't relate. They were just two substances that sort of rolled on in a parallel fashion. They looked as if they related. Uh, Malebranche similarly. Um, but the beginning of Western philosophy, really, modern Western philosophy and modern mathematics and modern science comes from Descartes, uh, arguably. And he posited uh, famously a substance dualism. So mind and matter are both separate substances, but they interact. Where they interact at the pineal gland. How is that possible? Descartes was never really, never really gave the answer. So a lot of people don't really accept that today. In fact, most um, articles in philosophy are against substance dualism. But I, I think it's probably the most sort of common global metaphysical schema in, or belief in terms of if you think about the religions of the world. Um, contrast to that, in the mid 20th century, eliminativism was, was a sort of key metaphysical position, which was extreme physicalism, which was the view that uh, basically mind did not exist, consciousness did not exist at all. This is very convenient for people studying consciousness because they didn't really have to, and everything went down to uh, measurable physical components. Um, but this led to a lot of paradoxes. Um, logical behaviorism was one form of eliminativism, which is that you know, happiness doesn't really exist. There's just smiling and jumping and laughing. But it became unfashionable uh, for various reasons I can talk about later. Um, Yeguan Kim, a philosopher of mine, says epiphenomenalism is, is, is the kind of general physicalism of today in, in the neurosciences, which is the view that mind um, emerges from matter, but mind has no effect back upon matter. That would be, in other words, there's no free will and there's no mental causation generally. Um, so in other words, my desire doesn't make me move towards the bar or um, my conscious calculation has no effect on my hand writing something. Um, again, it's hard to believe this because you think human intelligence surely has some effect upon the world and the way we create technology and so on. Um, so more and more common philosophy um, is emergentism, that yes, you, know, you need the brain for mind, but uh, still the mind must have an effect upon the brain and the body in return. Otherwise, for example, Karl Popper argued that it must do so, otherwise it wouldn't have evolved. Consciousness would not have evolved in humans, presumably other creatures as well. Why would it evolve if it had no power, causal power whatsoever? Um, some people say, well, it's like a spandrel. You know, sometimes we evolve things which have no purpose, but with that, could you really call consciousness, uh, which has evolved and maintained itself in several species, spandrel, unlikely. Um, in the mid-20th century, uh, was what, this was common second neural identity theory, which meant that the mind is the brain. It's simply exactly the same thing. We just use different language to describe the two. Um, but that was like overnight um, overcome by, um, by an argument relating to octopuses. I won't go into it now. Um, in the last 10 years or so, panpsychism has become a prevalent view. I did my PhD on panpsychism. It's the view that um, all of nature has mind. Um, so not just humans and mammals with brains, but also insects, plants, fungi, even molecules, all the way down. Um, which sounds crazy if you've never heard of it before, but um, it's, uh, 
I, I can make the case, but anyway, maybe for the pub. Um, idealism is the view, you know, being Germany, I said, like Kant, Immanuel Kant, Schopenhauer, people like this, Schelling, um, is the view that actually all, everything we see is just a projection of our minds. You know, just as colors and smells and tastes are projections of our minds, so is space and time and causality. Um, and then there's neutral monism. So the, the, the sort of purple triangle is something else that is the cause of or is expressed by mind and matter. Um, and then we have um, the transcendent as well. People like Karl Popper, Roger Penrose today, Gerdell, Bertrand Russell, and so on. They believe that as well as um, our spatiotemporal world, there must exist another realm outside of space and time wherein exists like uh, the Pythagorean theorem and things like this. Anyway, that's just a menu, a brief, a small menu of metaphysical options. As you saw in the Matrix, there are many more. Um, and I'm going to, <clears throat> the point of all this is to show that um, this menu um, should be brought in with, when um, integrating psychedelic experiences as part of, not replacing, but as part of that integrative phase. So let's look at um, metaphysical uh, experiences uh, induced by psychedelics. I'll just check the time here so I don't go overboard. Oh, no, it's fine. Right. Um, okay, so we're going to look at this segment here where metaphysics um, coincides with psychedelic experience and with mysticism. Generally, we have um, one can generalize into four main uh, metaphysical experiences that um, psychedelics can induce, don't only induce, like I said, it can also induce um, fighting skills and stuff. But it seems in the West, at least, uh, metaphysical experiences are more prevalent now, uh, but also elsewhere, I should say. Um, so monism, so um, the view that there's just one substance, and that substance um, includes both mind and matter. So pantheism, that God is nature. Cosmopsychism, that is a background radiation of mentality. Uh, cosmic consciousness, this is sometimes called, coined by Edward Carpenter. Uh, panpsychism, again, um, that you feel that everything is united, the universe is one. Uh, nature connectedness, timelessness, also known as the eternal, and so on. Then we have transcendentalism, so that's the Platonic realm, uh, other realms, maybe beings in other realms, n dimensional space. Theism, uh, not pantheism, but the other forms, so, you know, a god that exists outside of this world. Um, polytheism, gods that exist, panentheism, that God is this world and more outside of it. Novel qualia, I'll get to later. Substance dualism, people like Groff, for example, spoke about past life regression, that sort of entails that the soul, something like the soul must have existed before this body. Uh, astral projection, animist dualism, animism doesn't have to be dual, but it can be. And then idealism, so um, Humphrey Davy, for example, have you heard of, who's heard of Humphrey Davy here? So Humphrey Davy is out of interest. Just uh, two of you, that's, that's sad. Because <laughs> Humphrey Davy was um, a great um, British uh, scientist, chemist, would say today, but he called himself a chemical philosopher. And in, I, he's one of the first Western scientists to experiment with psycho psychedelics, what we now call psychedelics, if you include nitrous oxide as a psychedelic, which I do. Another, another conversation. But um, he, in 1799, Humphrey Davy took um, 200 pints of nitrous oxide in a big sort of tank, you know, where actually 160 pints in the tank stepped out and said, give me some more, I want 40 pints more. Took that, and then afterwards he had this, he said, everything is made of thoughts, right? So in other words, he came up with a, an idealist metaphysics. And that was the first, uh, there are other people as well, but that was really the first um, psychedelic experience. Um, 40 years later, uh, dentists realized they could use nitrous oxide for um, for pain removal, as it were. But the first, was, the first use um, came up with a metaphysical answer. Talking about J William James as well, he, he took uh, nitrous oxide, and, 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 and similarly he said, you know, he said, um, you know, only on nitrous oxide have I been able to understand the idealism of Hegel. And he recommends all other people to take it as well. So, Maybe there's some connection between nitrous oxide and idealism. I don't know. There's, there's a research project, right? Anyway, William James it defined the mystical experience, and he was one of the first really to coincide the mystical experience with the psychedelic experience. Um, he said there are four, four criteria by which to um, identify it. So ineffability, you can't speak about it, even though then he uses 200 words to speak about it afterwards. Um, noetic quality, you feel like what you're experiencing is real, more real than what you see now. 
uh, transiency, which is his view that these effects only last maximum two hours. Of course, he didn't have LSD at the time. And uh, passivity, which meant, means that you, you, are, you have lost control. You're completely in the control of the drug or the experience. Bertrand Russell also spoke about mystic, uh, mysticism. I don't think he smoked anything. Well, tobacco, there you go, sort of purple tobacco. But he said there are four um, criteria, intuition, revelation, rather than uh, rationality, intellect. So you, you understand things uh, not, not discursively, not through reason, but through another method. Um, he wrote that unity was very common for mysticism. So, quote, pantheism in religion, monism in philosophy. We'll return to those things later. The unreality of time, which we'll come back to, and the unreality of good and evil, uh, or at least going beyond an anthropocentric good and evil. Walter Stace built upon, well, especially James, and came up with these um, seven criteria for the mystical experience. And this was the basis of the Hood mysticism scale, which is used still today in clinical trials. And in fact, most of the um, scales used today, which we, we in Exeter have sought to um, work upon further. So uh, the unitary consciousness, the one, the void, pure consciousness, unity, as I said, non-spatial, non-temporal, that's introverted only, eyes closed only, really. Sense of objectivity or reality, noeticism, blessedness, peace. Now that is a form of mysticism which you wouldn't really get in metaphysics. Um, a feeling of the holy, the sacred, or divine, again, more mysticism than metaphysics. Paradoxicality, so for example, um, I was both here and there at the same time, or something was outside and inside at the same time, and uh, alleged by mystics to be ineffable, so again, from, uh, from uh, William James. Now, I just, I just put, a, put a little um, qualifier here, a little warning. Um, so William James and Aldous Huxley and people like that were perennialists. They thought that um, these experiences um, were the same regardless of culture. Now, the interpretation of them was culture dependent, but the actual experience was at the peak level always the same. Um, part of the perennial philosophy, so called. But um, in 1978, Stephen Katz, a scholar of Ju Judaism, um, wrote this influential paper where he, where he proposed contextualism instead. So, contextualism, he, well, he wrote this there are no pure, unmediated experiences. In other words, even the experience, the peak, mystical experience, induced by psychedelics or not, um, are determined by one's culture, not just the interpretation, the actual experience. And um, so, so, to put it bluntly, contextualism is that mystical experience is conditioned by our ideological context. We talk about Western context, perhaps. And perennialism is the view that mystical experience deconditions experience from our ideological context, takes us away from um, you know, good and evil, for example, as Russell said. This is a very interesting debate. I think the third, you know, middle way is um, probably the case, but it's something to discuss and something that perhaps should be uh, taken into account in the integrative stage as well. Let's look at some specific metaphysical experiences then occasioned by psychedelics. That's a good time to start with. This is from Carlo Rovelli, who's a well-known physicist, and it was LSD that had actually got him into physics, apparently. Quote, LSD was an extraordinarily strong experience that touched me also intellectually. Among the strange phenomena was a sense of time stopping. Things were happening in my mind, but the clock was not going ahead. The flow of time was not passing anymore. It was a total subversion of the structure of reality. Can you have experience that is outside of time? This seems almost like a contradiction in terms. But there's many arguments to say that you can. Spinoza, for example, argued it as well. How would you, if you had that psychedelic experience, how could you integrate that into the, your life later on without thinking about these metaphysical questions? Well, you could, but perhaps it could be augmented by metaphysics. Infinity, this is by Richard Ward, who took LSD in 1957. Um, it is impossible to convey the horror of thus being threatened with sheer nothingness, the fear of infinity. I wished I had the courage to try to find out where one is if one is nowhere. Again, metaphysical, not necessarily religious, not spiritual, necessarily. It depends how you define those terms. And all of those terms are ambiguous, by the way. There's no absolute answer to those questions. It depends which thinker you read or speak to. From Richard Ward again. I realized on 100 micrograms LSD 
that the whole universe is made up of things which have their own natures, relationships, significances, and that in some universal scale, each thing has its proper degree of awareness. That is, then, um, the notion of panpsychism. Interestingly, this was written in this great book called A Drug Taker's Notes. Um, uh, in 1957, um, by Richard Ward, and, and, and at the time, eliminativism was the thing in academia, you know, so it's, it's for him to sort of uh, advocate a panpsychism based on LSD there, it was sort of before its time, but also sort of mm, indicates in a way the, the sort of uh, universality of it. Panpsychism is related to animism, which I'll speak about in a moment. Nature connectedness, there are a degree of different forms of nature connectedness, this is the extreme Scale, extreme end of the scale from Paul Devereux. On oh, LSD, I found my awareness slipping inside that of the daffodil. While still being conscious of sitting in a chair, I could also sense my petals. Then an exquisite sensation cascaded through me, and I knew I was experiencing light falling on those petals. It was virtually orgasmic, the haptic equivalent of an angelic choir. How do you assess something like that? I don't know. Um, Alan, what classic from Alan Watts here? On pantheism. Pantheism, again, is the notion that God is the universe. The universe is God. The individual discovers, LSD, I should say, the individual discovers himself to be one continuous process with God, with the universe. Same thing. To those who have known it, it is as real and overwhelming as falling in love. Patrick Lundberg, uh, a fellow Swedish... Um, Psychonaut said that pantheism is a core, va core value of psychedelic experience. Um, another thing we look at in metaphysics is the reality of the past and memory. Like, wh wh what if you think the past, you know, the, is it fictional? Is it real? Is it unreal? Was it real? A um, lot of discussion about this. Interestingly, on, on uh, psychedelics, we can sometimes access the past, it seems, in ways we can't normally. For example, in Oliver Sacks' uh, great book, Hallucinations, um, from someone called Eric S. Then my whole life flashed in my mind from birth to the present with every detail that ever happened, every feeling and thought, visual and emotional was there in an instant. You know, interestingly, um, there's this book called uh, Confessions of an English Opium Eater by Thomas De Quincey, written in the 1820s, I think. And in it, he says he, on opium, he uh, had these great visions as well. I mean, he, you know, he took high doses. And, um, he, argued, he said that, you know, uh, quite often he would experience his, part, you know, his childhood in exquisite detail. And, and as a result, he said, it's now my firm belief that, m you know, memories are never lost, just access to them are lost. And of course, this is part of, part of psychedelic therapy, it seems, accessing past memories. But what does that mean metaphysically? What does it mean physiologically? Why are there... This is, now, this is not directly to related to psychedelics, but I will relate it. Ye Guan Kim, a philosopher of mine, died two years ago. He writes this. Why are there just these qualia and not other possible ones? That remains a mystery. <coughs> qualia means things like colours, sounds, sensations, redness, um, the taste of tea, and, you know, and so on. Um, why do we have just these ones? Why do we have just these colours? OK, you can argue, well, we can only sort of um, see this l limit of the electromagnetic spectrum. But why should those frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum be just the colors we have? That remains a mystery. Why can they be? As long as you could use other qualia and navigate in the world, they would be just as useful. Now, one interesting thing with psychedelics I've noted is that um, now and again, one get gr is granted access to novel qualia. In other words, um, qualia that are just not part of normal human everyday Consciousness. What does that mean metaphysically about this qualia? Is it access to a transcendent realm? <coughs> how, do we, how, can we, how can we explain it? Um, entities, of course, very common. I just went to a, another conference on entities. Here's an example from Rick Strasman's DMT patients. As I accepted my death and dissolution into God's love, the insectoids began to feed on my heart, devouring the feelings of love and surrender. They feasted as they made love to me. It was extremely alien, though not necessarily unpleasant. <laughs> you know, I must say that um, entities, especially little ones, are a real mystery. You know, they're very common, the psychedelics. And not only are they common in the West, they're common around the world. Um, certainly, like um, from this Davy Coffin Hour book, Falling Sky, I mentioned, um, there's this belief in ancestral spirits, which appears little Lilliputians, little people. Um, also, just reading a paper on uh, the Chinese... Shao Ren Ren, little people that are seen when taking a certain fungus. Um, why 
are little people seen throughout the world? I don't, no clue. You know. um, now, coming back to animism, this, this is from my friend um, uh, Luis Eduardo Luna, who's just joined Exeter University with us, actually. Um, he wrote, it's impossible to understand a marine Indian animist culture without reference to these psychedelic plants. So animism, if you don't know, is the view that um, nature is alive, or let nature, like trees, have their own sentiences, have their own points of view. They can think, feel, well, they can at least feel. Um, it's similar to panpsychism, um, though there are different, interesting differences. But, um, I mean, this relates to the last talk, of course, you know, to a certain extent. It's impossible to understand animism without reference to these psychedelic plants. And animism is, um, uh, is one metaphysical point of view. So animism is not, uh, metaphysics rather, is not a Western way of looking at um, experience. It's uh, global. Benny Shannon, in this uh, seminal book, The Antipodes of the Mind, charting the phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience, writes this. Overall, ayahuasca induces a comprehensive metaphysical view of things. I would characterize it as idealistic monism with pantheistic overtones. That's a very uh, a unique kind of view. Reality is conceived as constituted by one non-material substance which is identified as cosmic consciousness. Spinoza would accept them. So in this seminal um, anthropological book, um, there's reference made to metaphysics. I should also quickly say that, you know, when um, the word psychedelic was coined by the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond in 1957, well, actually, in 1956, in, in Letters with Huxley, but it was published in 1957. And in that paper, he said, these psychedelic substances, you know, um, they have a medicinal value that we should explore. I mean, he was a psychiatrist. But he also emphatically emphasized the fact that there are also religious, social, and philosophical implications of these drugs. 1957. Um, by 1957, philosophers were not really interested in that because they didn't even believe in consciousness, let alone psychedelic consciousness. So it was left to the wayside, unfortunately. I mentioned, he mentioned Spinoza. Um, Albert Hoffman, a great Swiss chemist, in um, his book, LSD, My Problem Child, in the very last chapter, Experiencing Reality, the epigraph, the first sentence of it, uh, is a quotation from Goethe, which reads... What more can a person gain in life than that God nature reveals himself to him? So Albert Hoffman was um, very interested in metaphysics as well. Um, he spoke about it with his friend Ernst Jünger I mean, quite often. And um, there he's quoting Goethe, but Goethe there is sort of um, paraphrasing Spinoza. Because it was Spinoza who first, well, not first, yeah, one of the first Westerners to say that God and nature were the same thing. Um, but he was suppressed for this. Um, People thought he was an atheist. If you're saying that nature is God, then you're just basically saying there's only nature, right? There's no God. He was suppressed. He was, um, his books were banned by the church, and his fellow Jews excommunicated him. He lived in Amsterdam most of his life. Um, yet, 100 years later, and presently, um, his philosophy has become um, popular, I should say, but it never hit the Western mainstream. You know, the Western mainstream was generally... Um, Cartesian came from Descartes, strangely, because Descartes divided reality into mind and matter. With the Industrial Age, science said, let's forget about mind, let's just look at matter in the way that Descartes and his followers saw it, which was just dead material without any sentience. And uh, technology and the Industrial Revolution, and the ecological disaster uh, uh, came from that. It's a pity, because if Spinoza had been um, more prevalent uh, then perhaps we would be in a different world. Anyway, um, you see here, I'm not going to explain Spinozism, but God is nature is the same thing. That's pantheism. Thought and extension are both um, expressions of that one God substance. Um, therefore, there's a panpsychism there and a neutral monism. I can take questions on that. I can do a whole lecture on this alone. Um, interestingly, in, in um, Spinoza's uh, last book, The Ethics, in the last part of The Ethics, he writes about this rare state of experience that he calls amor de intellectualis, which means the intellectual love of God. Remember, God is nature. And he writes, actually in the previous book as well, the highest good is the knowledge of the union that the mind has with the whole of nature. So he says this experience is rare and difficult to achieve. Um, and a lot of Spinoza scholars can't make heads nor tails of it. They just don't understand. But really, Deleuze spoke about it, for example. He said, this is the, the flash of Spinoza. Roman Roland said that, actually. Deleuze quoted him. Um, that you can understand Spinoza intellectually, but you can also have 
an immediate intuition of Spinozism as a whole, you know, got pantheism. Um, perhaps psychedelics can do this. Um, but let's say you have this Spinozan or pantheistic insight on psychedelics, but you've never heard of pantheism or Spinoza. Would it not help to look at it? Would it not help to look at the logical arguments for it, as opposed to dismissing it as mere, you know, spirituality or something like this? I've written about this in the book, Philosophy and Psychedelics, uh, from Bloomsbury, um, The White Sun of Substance, Spinozism and the Psychedelic Amor Dei Intellectualis, if you're interested. I compare it especially, I compare especially Spinoza's ontology with the phenomenology of 5-MeO-DMT. Yes, unusual, but anyway, have a, have a read. Um, so you might be thinking, okay, but metaphysics surely is part of the past, and there's nothing that psychedelic science today should deal with. Well, you can't avoid metaphysics, I'm afraid, because of something called the mind-matter problem, or the hard problem of consciousness. Coined by David Chalmers, but it uh, goes back 2,000 years at least. The hard problem. Why is all this physiological processing in the brain accompanied by an, inex in, by an experienced inner life? Why, you know, why, you know, we're looking at, you know, things moving. Why is that correlated to mind experience. A solution to this problem may profoundly affect our conception of the universe and our, of ourselves. In other, word, in other words, a solution to this hard problem of consciousness will affect our metaphysical point of view. We don't have a solution. Therefore, we should be you know, open-minded, I would argue, to all metaphysical positions out there. You can't just scan a brain and think you've understood it. Um, this is from Yegwan Kim again. Making a running list of psychoneural correlations, like, in other words, scanning the brain when someone's having a psychedelic experience, for example, does not come anywhere near gaining an explanatory insight into why there are such correlations. That is, the neural correlates of consciousness present rather than solve the hard problem of consciousness. So it's metaphysics, not neuroscience alone, that is required for a solution. <coughs> So when we look at all these brain scans of people under psychedelics, you know, we should be aware that this really doesn't explain much. I mean, it makes connections, it's important, and it can be used in therapy, but it's not a sufficient, sufficient explanation. It's part explanation. So the mind-matter problem keeps the metaphysical options open for interpreting psychedelic experience. So here's the last part, the sort of um, conjecture uh, that I'm working on at the moment. Psychedelic integration with metaphysics. So, uh, you know, psychedelic science is a very young science, as we all know. You know I'm surprised half of you have never been to a conference before in psychedelics. Um, it's a very young science. So, within that, the concept, the idea of psychedelic integration is even younger. So, I'm just putting forward an idea here um, to sort of augment psychedelic integration. Not replace it, like I say, but add to it. Primary point is this, again, psychedelic-induced metaphysical experiences should be integrated with recourse to metaphysics. So like I say, if you feel that all is one, if you feel that you are connected to nature, um, you, can, you should be asked, like, well, how, could you, how can you explain that? It's one thing saying that psychedelics induce nature connectedness. Some great papers on that by Sam Gandhi, who's giving a talk here, for example. But the question, in my mind at least, is still like, but why? You know, what, what does that mean? Is that just a hallucination, this nature connectedness? Or is there some truth to it? Is there some veridicality to that? And how would you determine that? You determine it by looking at metaphysical theories. Unlike most, and, and consider this, unlike most other forms of therapy, psychedelic therapy often, not always, often involves metaphysical experience. So psychedelic, this is the, in a way the unique thing about psychedelic um, therapy, it involves metaphysics. Other forms of therapy don't necessarily do that. Well, don't, generally. But of course, psycho now, all respect here to psychotherapists, etc. but psychotherapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, clinicians and all are not trained in metaphysics. It's not in their professional ambit. Um, and I, you know, I work with many at Exeter and elsewhere. They just don't know about these things. And, of course, they shouldn't, you know, they've got enough time to study what they need to study. But as a result, it doesn't come into the integrated phase. Uh, this is a table from a, a paper that just came out, uh, referenced below there, on psychedelic integration and, an and analysis of the concept and its practice in Frontiers in Psychology. Um, you see there's, um, well, eight main models on the left there. Um, all, I'm sure, have their pros and cons. Um, but there's none on metaphysics at all. 
not a single one. There are, let's, let's talk about the spiritual, the metaphysical, you know, they're all sort of the same sort of vague idea, but there's no real, real uh, use of metaphysics. So here's my conjecture. Offering a patient a schema of metaphysical perspectives for integration may, or may not, extend long-term benefits of psychedelic therapy. So I wouldn't give them this matrix, obviously, that would just confuse them, but some kind of handbook or something like this. Uh, we're developing this now. But the conjecture, so it might not be true, is that if someone's had a... I mean, I, I've met many people who have had life-changing experiences uh, taking psychedelics. Um, my conjecture is, if later on, you know, if they think, well, that was, you know, I did think that nature was God, but that must be just nonsense, right? Uh, if you give them the facilities to understand that such views are not necessarily merely just based on faith or religion, but based on centuries, if not millennia, of reasoned logical argument, they might be more inclined to take more seriously and take of more significance their experience. Psychedelic experience, even without metaphysical integration, can seemingly open people's minds up to other metaphysical viewpoints that they may never have otherwise have considered. So Chris Timmerman, is he here? He's speaking soon, I think, tomorrow. Um, he did this paper last year um, showing that um, there's a general shift away from physical, the metaphysical view of physicalism to panpsychism under psychedelics. Um, interesting question is, again, for me, why this may be. Um, Charles Hartshorn, the philosopher, he wrote about this prosaic fallacy, which is the view that um, people dismiss other metaphysical views quite often because they've never had the opportunity, they can't experience, they can't imagine what it would be like, for example, for a plant to have any form of sentience, so it's dismissed. Psychedelics seem to overcome that fallacy. So, um, so yeah, psychedelics without metaphysical uh, integration may itself have therapeutic benefits. In fact, the evidence shows that it does, of course. Um, but with metaphysical integration, offering a post-experience menu, as it were, of metaphysical possibilities, like with this matrix and so on, for interpreting one's psychedelic experiences, might instill longer-term therapeutic benefits by means of managed integration. So that's the conjecture. So then, as I said, certain metaphysical view experiences could be viewed within a legitimate, rational-based metaphysical perspective and thus not quickly uh, dismissed as delusional or anomalous. Um, it would be, as I emphasize again, one part of the general integrative phase, and there are many different models at the moment of how to integrate, you know. It wouldn't, I don't, I'm not saying it should be only, the only phase, of course not. Psychotherapists know a lot more about healing people than metaphysicians do, without doubt. But because psychedelic um, therapy involves metaphysical experience, this should be an aspect of it. Um, the integrative phase would be metaphysically neutral, so I personally have um, biases, preferences for metaphysical views towards Spinoza, Whitehead, for example. But uh, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be important, although I do think that you know, you know, can, it will be part of it. Um, it's important, I suppose, not to prime expectations. So it wouldn't be part of a preparatory or concurrent phase of any trials. You know, you don't want to say, have you heard of spinosism? And then they take a psychedelic and they say, guess what? I just experienced spinosism. You know, that would be, wouldn't prove anything for other, other trials. So it would be part of the, of the later phase. It would be integrated within integration, in other words. For the conjecture, there can be no adequate integration of psychedelics without metaphysics. That is the conjecture, and this can be tested. So, thank you for your time, and we'll happily accept questions. Hello? All right, great. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question on a note that you made and that was that you said that you've noted that there are qualia that are only accessed in psychedelic experiences. Mm. Uh, my twofold question is firstly, could you uh, say something more, describe these qualia, or at least note them <laughs> a little more? And secondly, what exactly do you mean by access here? Because there may be two senses. Do you mean 
accessed in the sense that these qualia are usually in some sense present in the world but not within the scope of our consciousness or there may be a milder, milder sense in which it might be taken which is to say that these qualia are features of the psychedelic experience and not features of our usual experience and that would be to say they're not out there in the world and not then something we fail to access in usual experience they're just unusual features of the psychedelic experience mm. so those are my two questions thanks okay um i'll answer the second one first and then give examples or try to um so you can have qualia i think qualia are not just seen with um senses open eyes open for example but you can also imagine them or dream them or whatever right so you close your eyes imagine purple i think most people can do that not all but most people can so um by access i do mean not something that is um, ac not something that we could ever access without alterations in the body by means of these drugs or by means of meditation, breath work, or some other means. You know, um, examples of them. Well, the problem is, of course, this is where ineff ineffability comes in. Um, we have words for red, green, blue, um, coffee, tasted coffee, whatever. We don't have words for um, experiences, qualia that that are not common, because we never need to share, the, share what we mean. But um, I, had, I haven't had it, but someone told me uh, only a few weeks ago that they, they saw a new prime color, you know, something that we can't imagine. So not another shade of red or something, but a new prime color. It's one way to sort of conceptualize it, even though we can't imagine it. But even more than that, and I don't mean necessarily synesthesia, you know, hearing colors and seeing sounds and so on, but another form of a qual, which is not color, which is not sound, which is not smell, taste, or some bodily somatic feeling, but something completely different. And you, can, you, you therefore can't really express it. You can only express it apophatically, you know, via, negatively. It's not this, it's not that, but it's still an experience. And this is what I mean, this is why I use the word novel. You know, it's completely new. Um, so then the question is, well, how is this possible? If, if that is the case, and I've experienced it myself, so I'd say it was, <laughs> um, how is it possible? What does it mean about colors, the ontological status of colors? I mean, it's more of a question, really, for philosophers than people seeking uh, you know, to get out of depression or something. But nonetheless, it's part of the metaphysics of psychedelic experience. So I should say that I've only been talking about you know, um, therapy here, but I don't see psychedelics as only in the remit of therapy. I think you can enrich people's lives generally, and it can enrich society as a whole, culturally as well. So these um, deeper metaphysical questions is part of that cultural enrichment. Thank you. <laughs> also, could, uh, could people asking questions please stand up as well so that people can see them and it makes nice pictures as well. <laughs> Thank you for your conjecture, which I find interesting. I come from the clinical um, part, and of course we would like to give the most effective therapies to anyone. Uh, how would you suggest to um, deliver these concepts to people who are not very academically mm. skilled? Yeah, that's, this is the tricky part. So, <laughs> um, so we, we sort of went through that a bit when we created questionnaires from that metaphysical matrix. You know, it's very hard, actually, to create uh, understandable questions. And we tested them out and so on. Um, but it is possible, I think, um, at least to the greatest extent. In terms of the actual integrative phase, I mean, this is something uh, that you would know more about than me. But I would suggest this. There's a few options. For example, you could train um, therapists in metaphysics, you know, like very basically at least enough to be effective. You could create a handbook for clinicians and patients, uh, both. Um, or you could hire metaphysicians to come in. I would argue against that last one. But <laughs> you're horribly wrong. But, but, but there, there, will, there will be a number of methods, you know, just as you learn other clinical therapeutic methods. So this would just be part of that. Of course, it hasn't been developed, something new. But something, I think, important. But we are working on it, I'll, yeah. There's a paper coming out soon, so look out for that. Um, I have a question. You're in, in many right. of your slides, you're saying psychedelic metaphysical integration. What do you 
practically mean? How how does it look in practice? What does this integration? Because for me, it's two separate things. And how what what do you do in that experience to integrate it? Well, it's partly related to the last question. So, um, in a clinical si scenario, um, you would. I mean, this is all conjectural, theoretic, but you would um, offer patients other ways of understanding what they've gone through, rather than um, ways that are develop, have been developed in psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and so on, which don't generally refer to metaphysical experiences. So it would be a, an enrichment of that um, therapeutic model, I suppose. How would you do it? In ways I've just mentioned. You know, you could train practitioners in the rudiments of metaphysics, you can create a handbook that would help with that. You could have courses on it, for example, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, thank you, Peter, for a great talk. Good to see you. Um, firstly, so I'm a psychedelic uh, therapist using MDMA, psilocybin, and uh, ketamine. Um, I think the viewpoint from a clinical point of view is that the patient brings whatever they want and that's what we work with. So if they bring metaphysical ideas and we would go with that, sometimes patients say, my heart chakras were open. Sometimes they say it was great to have my amygdala switched off. Sometimes they say that was really good with the default mode network closed down. So you go with whatever they have rather than impose your own um, integrational model. So I'm not so sure that we need to impose metaphysics upon people it's already there if they bring it and indeed you could argue that there's almost too much metaphysics as you know from all the previous thousands of years use with a, a sort of more of a spiritual element um but also isn't isn't there almost something that the whole concept of psychedelic spirituality and anathema itself an almost laughable anathema isn't psychedelic spirituality or metaphysics proof of an organic material basis for consciousness and psychedelics because you've actually taken an organic compound that's resulted in this subjective conscious change um, then doesn't the entire the entire subject of metaphysics and spirituality just go out the window in the in the light of that thanks for your questions ben good to see you um, first thing is i wouldn't say you should certainly not impose metaphysical options like this is what you must believe now i'm not saying that i'm just saying you en enlarge you can enlarge people's options. They, can, they will bring in their own you know, uh, metaphysical viewpoints now and again. But I mean, a lot of, these, a lot of people haven't heard of that other options. They might be interested to see that as an experience that they were not anticipating, how that might fit into a bigger picture. And it seems, um, thinking about the blue dot that Federico um, showed, you know, we live on this little blue dot in the middle of the universe. Not in the middle, somewhere in the universe. Um, <laughs> um, a mechanism of psychedelic action is that you see yourself, or one mechanism at least, seems to be, at least from what I understand, um, that one sees oneself in the grander scheme of things, you know? And th thus, you know, like in Exeter, we're, they're looking at Ketam, you know, with Celia, who you work with as well, don't you? Um, you see that your personal problems are relatively insignificant in this grander picture of, uh, scale of things. And this is what has, this is one mechanism of action, it seems. That grander scheme of things is what I call metaphysics. I do not conflate spiritual, spirituality with metaphysics. So metaphysics is a strict, academic, rigorous um, enterprise. Spirituality is often something that is not. Um, the second point brings us straight into metaphysics, right? <laughs> so is it not the case, you're arguing, correct me if I'm wrong, that we take a physical thing and changes the physical body, therefore surely, Physicalism must be the explanation. Um, not at all. And I'll tell you why. For example, to take another metaphysical point of view, like neutral monism, which is um, the view that Einstein, who I just discovered uh, formulated relativity here in Bern, um, Einstein was a Spinozist. And Spinoza's view is this. Why? Because he said Spinoza was the greatest of modern philosophers because ma he made mind and body the same thing. And um, so in Spinoza's metaphysic, um, one expression of, God, of nature is as matter. Another expression or attribute, he says, of it is mind or consciousness. They are the same thing seen from two different perspectives. So just like um, Venus can be seen from the perspective or the um, idea of the morning star and the evening star. You know, two terms, but they mean essentially the same thing, Venus. So for Spinoza, mind and matter are like the morning and evening star, the two perspectives on one substance. So he says all of matter has its parallel mind. 
Um, but that also means that you know, all of matter, that's a fake plant, isn't it? But <laughs> so plants generally um, have um, forms of mind as well. They're not like human minds at all. They might not have intellectual thoughts or reminiscing about what they did last weekend and stuff like that. But they might have the light in, in the sun or something like this, right? Um, so that also comes out of that parallelism between mind and matter. So under that parallelism, if you took a drug that changed your body, it would also change your mind. That doesn't mean physicalism is therefore true. It also works under the theory of neutral monism. For example, that's what one example, you know. So, and the question itself is an interesting metaphysical question, so it can't be avoided. So, you, you, like I say, you can't avoid metaphysics. You, you had a metaphysical question yourself. But good, good to discuss it. Um, so, uh, a, a question, Peter. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm here on, on, on your right. I have ah, to sign up. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, familiar faces today. Right? Uh, yeah. So, um, one of the things that, uh, that came out of this uh, metaphysical beliefs research was the potential ethical and moral consequences uh, linked to having a psychedelic substance change your metaphysics, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess we can discuss that about. But one of the things that, on, on my reflections of it, thought was a necessary way to think about integration of metaphysics uh, is a form of practice. And the most obvious form of practice that I, that I kind of consider a form of metaphysical practice is meditation. So what are your thoughts on, on that as a, as a potential way of having uh, metaphy uh, metaphysics, uh, metaphysical integration? Yeah. That's a very interesting um, idea, actually, to use meditation for metaphysical integration. That's one, that one step on further. Yeah, I haven't thought about that, but... Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, this is, is actually a very good idea, isn't it? Because you're focusing on one thing. Um, meditation, of course, means also intellectualizing about something. Thus, Descartes' book, you know, the meditations. Um, but you mentioned at the beginning ethical considerations stemming from it as well. And I just, you know, so there has been there have been, as you know, um, papers on how psychedelics um, make you appreciate nature more, for example, right? Um, through nature connectedness, for example. Now, um, understanding that nature connectedness through, okay, I'm using my bias here, and that's Spinoza again, for example, right? Um, perhaps gives you um, more of a, an anchor, more of a foundation uh, to think about the world and reality generally, you know, which can help yourself, but also the world itself. I mean, Arne Ness, the Norwegian philosopher, was quoted by um, Federico. You know, Arne Ness was the founder of deep ecology, and Anna Ness said that the foundations of deep ecology were, were really the philosophies of Spinoza, Whitehead, and Heidegger. So there is certainly an ethical dimension to this. Um, I don't want to get my personal biases too involved here because I just want to conjecture something neutrally. But I think that certain metaphysical point of views can be quite dangerous to the world. But like I say, I won't say which ones. <laughs> Need to stay neutral today. But in the pub later, maybe. I'll talk about it. But anyway, yeah, interesting idea. Meditation for metaphysical integration. Yeah, I think about that. Great. Good. It's developing already, see? Yeah, hello. Um, I have an, a question concerning what you already brought up. was discussed here a little bit. How to train or to raise awareness uh, in therapists for these experiences, metaphysical evidence. And the question I would like to ask, what do you think about the use of um, training therapists by self-experience themselves, these states of substance-induced mystical states? What's your role, what's in your opinion the role of self-experiencing in training? I am the opinion that experience is maybe more efficient to transfer this kind of knowledge than reading a book. Yeah, for sure. I would, well, okay. Um, well, of course, originally, you know, with, when, um, well, not originally, but in, in the 20th century, originally, was like, that's not even true. In, 90, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the purpose of LSD um, from Sandoz, you know, Hoffman's company, was for psychiatrists or therapists to take themselves so to understand psychosis, schizophrenia. So that, that self-experiment was actually the, origi well, the original 20th century um, therapeutic model. Uh, until they became illegal, of course. 
Um, I, I, let me think. Mike Jay is writing a book about this, actually, at the moment. I know this. Um, I think that it would be useful for therapists to have experienced this so that their empathy is greater and um, their understanding is better because a lot of it, like I said, is ineffable. So I should think it is useful. Um, but, of course, one has to be very careful with the law with regard to that and getting funding and clinical approval and so on and so forth. So, but, yeah, ultimately, I would say it was probably better than, than not. Anybody, anybody else? Question? Hello, thank you very much. So I try to formulate the question, it's about the integration part. <clears throat> In your research, did you also come over the topic of existential crisis after experiencing some kind of metaphysical experience? I have read about it. Um, and there are, no doubt, psychedelic trips that can cause that. Um, there are... I mean, there are dangers in these drugs, for sure. Um, you could have a... I mean, did you see the Richard Ward um, quotation about the fear of infinity, the fear, the fear of nothingness? I think this, this kind of thing can cause an existential, one type of existential crisis. You think, geez, that's, you know, this is the reality. There's absolute nothingness. Um, but how do you deal with that? I would say that, well, you have to put it into context, talk about its plausibility. Maybe, you know, I mean, like analyzing things metaphysically will also make you think that probably, you know, certain metaphysical viewpoints are not true. So still, I should say that the, the way of dealing with metaphysical or existential crisis is via, via metaphysics. Um, but having said that, I don't think... Um, I think we should be very careful about the dangers. I, I've met some people... I met one person, for example, who was possessed, had, audit, we would say, auditory hallucinations for months after taking DMT, for example. Another person who became suicidal because he thought death was not so bad after all. Um, these are serious, you know, um, issues that you have to take into account. And I don't, certainly don't have the answers myself, you know, but it, of course, just requires further research. Um, a rather simple, straightforward question. How do you, talking about mind and matter, how do you yourself imagine mind like matter it seems so clear mm. but then mind it's hard to 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 put it in words what it really is kind of although we all experience it so how would how do you make sense of this or what is mind for you mm. it's the classic question what is consciousness um which i get asked every week um i think I think, you know, Javi Chalmers, I think, said, you know, mind is the one thing that we know the most and the least at the same time. Um, I think there's two ways you can try to think about this. You can talk about the contents of mind, so you can divide it up into, you know, for example, emotions, qualia, the will, desire, intent, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, you know, cognition, um, and then, like, you know, the time rate, speed of consciousness, um, whether it's vertical or... or hallucinatory, and so on and so forth. I've actually got a nice um, slide about that. I didn't bring it today. Um, and then the other way you can think about it is how do you differentiate mind from matter? Or, well, the concept mind from the concept matter, because maybe they're the same thing, right? Uh, you have to be really careful words. I mean, there's a lot of philosophy on this. One way, some people say, you know, mind is private. You have private access to your own mind, but not to others. But that's got a lot of problems. Um, Brentano and others say that intentionality is the important thing about mind. In other words, the mind is always about something. You know, I love um, tea. You know, I hate coffee. I, I think about this. I, I, I um, am curious about that. You know, there's always a subject-object dichotomy with mind. In other words, mind reaches out, even if it's reaching to the self, um, whereas matter doesn't. It has got no intentionality. But that's arguable as well. Um, 
And Bertrand Russell says something like, um, mind is that which we know without inference. So we infer that matter exists you know, as the cause of what we see, but we don't infer that mind exists because we're directly acquainted with it. So there are all these different ways in which um, philosophers of mind distinguish the concepts mind and matter, but each of them are problematic. So essentially, we do not know. My own personal view is this. We don't know ma what matter is sufficiently. So um, if you look at the history of the concept of matter, it, it's cha constantly changing. You know, first of all, with Descartes, it's just space, extension. Then you add mass, energy, charge, spin, so on and so forth. We should be very careful not to think that what we know in physics today is the final answer. We don't. We know that physics is incomplete. You know, relativity, for example, and quantum physics don't, um, are not compatible. This is a big, big problem, of course, in physics. But also, um, we, we, we know that the concept of matter is not final. There are different, also, there are many different concepts of matter. Same with the mind. I don't think we know our minds fully either. So a conjecture for neutral monists is if we did know matter fully, and if we did know mind fully, we would see that they were the same thing in the depths. But that's another conjecture. Is there one last question, maybe? Yeah, behind you. Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, in your conception, uh, do you have a place for the soul, for example, as an entity different from the mind? If yeah, that would be that would be substance dualism, one of the images there. So that's the view then that the soul is distinct from the mind and commonly interacts. Oh, the soul. No, sorry. The soul is distinct from the body and commonly interacts with with the body. But it also means, of course, that when the body dies, the soul doesn't necessarily die. And there are different forms of that. You know, you can think that the soul is infinite backwards if you believe in metempsychosis, you know, reincarnation. Or you could think, if you're Roman Catholic, that it's created that conception, the soul, and then it's infinite forward, and so on. Uh, there are some good arguments for this dualism, but most philosophers reject it today because of the interaction problem more than, more than anything. How does something which is not physical interact with the physical? This seems to be a big problem for it. But, um, like I say, it's all of the... Every single metaphysical option is problematic, even the one that Western science bases itself upon, physicalism. It's hugely problematic. Mental causation, for example, is a massive problem for physicalism or naturalism, as it's called, you know, huge problem. So um, we just don't know. That's why we have to be open-minded and neutral about it. So thank you so much, Peter. I, can, I think we can give him a big one. Applause. Thank you. Thank you.